Welcome everyone to the second part of my bustle gown tutorial. In the last video, I tackled the skirt and overskirt. Today, I will be showing you how I made the bodice and the decorations. Just like the skirt, this evening bodice is made of silk taffeta flat lined with cotton lawn. I used heat sensitive pen to trace out the pattern so that there wouldn't be any marks left. It worked for the most part, but there has been a few times when I accidentally ironed out the wrong line and had to retrace it again with pencil. I cut out the lining first and used that as a guide for cutting the taffeta. This not only saves time, but also ensures that the two pieces are exactly the same size. Place 2mm away from the seam, and that also includes the darts. The evening bodice of the period is generally laced up in the back. To finish the center back seam, I folded the seam allowance on both layers towards the inside and ironed them down. I folded in the lining just a little bit more so that it wouldn't be seen at all from the outside. Draw a line an eighth of an inch away from the edge and stitch along the line. This way the center back seam is secured and a bowling channel is created. Next, I close the darts on the front piece. Take out the basting and trim down the seam allowance to about half an inch. Clip into the seam allowance every 3 or 4 inches apart, press it open, and slip stitch it down to the lining. At the time when serger wasn't even invented, a lot of the seam allowance in Victorian bodies were finished like so. The denser the slip stitch, the less likely that the fabric will fray. Then I assembled all six pieces of the bodice together. I was still planning on doing a fitting later just in case adjustments needed to be made, so I only pressed open the seam allowance but didn't stitch it down. I still had some sturdy plastic wool bone from my 1870s corset, so I used that as the center back boning of the bodice. Once the boning was set in, I marked out the placement of the eyelets one inch apart from one another. Use an awl to open up a hole and hand finish the eyelets. Although grommets were already quite popular in the 1870s, they were usually only used on corsets. Eyelets on bodices were still mostly made by hand. After all, they do look a lot more pleasing than large metal grommets. The few eyelets on the top and bottom can only be sewn once facing is pudding, so I just left them there for the time being. The bodice fits me quite well. The only issue is that my cat is refusing to let me get out of it. Since I didn't have to make any adjustments, I slip stitched all the seam allowance down like I did with the darts. <laughs> 
then comes the bone casing. A well-made Victorian bodice has boning on every single seam and darts to keep a clean and crisp silhouette. Usually, you would sandwich the boning in between two layers of bone casing tape and stitch the whole thing onto the seam allowance. Which means that if there are nine boning with a total length of five yards, you will need ten yards of tape. But I completely forgot the times two part when I was purchasing supplies, and only got five yards of tape. And that is why I ended up slip stitching the bone casing directly onto the seam allowance before inserting the bone. Since bodice boning doesn't need to bear much stress, I just went with the cheap Ridgeland boning. Then close up the bottom of the casing, the boning is all done. Next comes the most confusing part, which is finishing the bottom edge. I decided to put single piping down at the bottom, but before that, I traced out the bottom line of the bodice and made a two-inch wide facing. People usually would use bias tape for facing. I was only doing this because I was running out of fabric. To make the piping, I cut out a one-inch wide strip on bias, wrapped it around the cord, and stitched with a zipper foot. First, stitch the piping with the right side of the bodice. Then line up the seam allowance with the facing and stitch again. Draw a half inch seam allowance, turn and iron it down, and slip stitch it onto the lining. The top of the bodice is a lot easier since there's no piping. Run it through the machine and finish the other end by hand. Once the facing is all set, I went and finished the rest of the 32 eyelets. The bodice has two very short and puffy sleeves. To make the sleeves, gather the sleeve end into 10 inches wide and stitch it onto a piece of tool tape to stabilize it. Gather the sleeve cap as well and close up the side seam. Flip the twill tape onto the inside and whip stitch it in place. I'm not sure how historically accurate this is, it's just sort of a lazy way of doing a bubble hem. Anyway, I clipped into the seam of the armhole a few times and set the sleeves in. <laughs> 
finish the raw edge on the inside, I simply folded a 1 inch wide twill tape in half and slip stitched it on both sides. Finally, put the waistband in. Many Victorian bodices have waistbands on the inside, so that the tension on the waist is distributed onto the waistband instead of the seam on the bodice. At this point, I only had about half a yard left from the 9 yards of fabric. After exhausting many brain cells, I realized that in order to create what I envisioned in my sketch, I need at least 4 more yards of fabric just for decoration. However, the silver gray color of this fabric is so hard to find that I ended up spending two hours in the fabric store and found only one that was sort of close to the color. I cut it into several 7 inch wide pieces and connected them together to make the trim for the skirt. For the bottom of the trim, which is visible from the outside, I finished the edge by hand. But for the top part, which would eventually be covered, I just used the machine. I already have a separate video on making the accordion plate using a template, so I won't go deep into this part. It eventually took me about 40 hours just to make the pleats. Once the trim was pleated, I stitched along the top edge to keep the pleating in place. Place the bottom row along the hem of the skirt. For the middle row, I decided to use a different color that matches the color of the overskirt fringe. Luckily, I already had a beige taffeta that was just enough to make the second row. For the top row, I finished both edges by hand since the top part is not covered. I also drew a guideline to make sure that the stitching is perfect. Then I realized that the dark gray was a bit too dark and didn't go very well with the rest of the dress. So I made some really thin strips out of the same fabric and stitched it along the top of the overskirt fringe trim to bring the whole thing together. I didn't realize until later that it was a really subtle gesture that probably no one would notice. Now back to the bodice. I figured out the shape of the Bertha collar with a mock-up and went with the dark gray taffeta to make the actual thing. I pleated and basted the pieces individually and tacked them together at center front. I used the beige taffeta to make the center front tab, wrapped it around the collar piece and stitched it onto the bodice. The back of the collar was made of a simple trapezoid shape. I messed it up a little bit while making the pattern and the fabric was bunching up a lot in the middle after I pleated the sides. But then it kind of looked pretty intentional once I pressed it down with an iron. So it turned out to be a happy accident. I stitched in two side tabs where the front and back pieces meet. At first I made the shoulder seam a lot wider than that of the bodice. But I decided I didn't like it, so I took it apart and made it narrower. 
On the left side of the shoulder, I put snaps onto the back piece so that it's easier to put on the bodice. It is the Victorian era, so of course I had to put some lace in there. I gathered the bottom of the 1 inch lace trim and stitched it around the collar and sleeves. This was going to be the end of it, but then I felt like there was something missing in the front. So I made a flower using the silver grey fabric of the dress and stitched it onto the center front of the collar. And now the dress is finally, officially done. If it had taken any longer, I would probably have gone insane. Anyway, thank you all for supporting me through this long journey of 1876 bustle gown reconstruction, and I have no idea when the next video will come out or what it's gonna be about. So I guess stay tuned!